There was much to look forward to as we arrived at Edgbaston for the first test match between England and South Africa after the debacle of Antigua where England had that dreadful collapse and Michael Atherton resigned as England captain and now the new era, Alex Stewart, the return of Darren Goff and Dominic Cork and of course South Africa, Alan Donald and the fielding of Jonty Rhodes. Alex Stewart brought with him a fresh optimism and his overpowering will to win almost at any cost promised an intriguing contest against the toughest of sporting nations. Hansi Cronier versus Alex Stewart. Hmm, I wonder whether this battle will go the distance. Edgbaston offered England the chance to repeat their mauling of Australia the year before, although this time they'd have to cope with the return of home bowlers Alan Donald and Sean Pollock of the Warwickshire County Cricket Club. And so with England losing the toss under grey skies on a damp, lively pitch, one of cricket's great confrontations resumed. Alan Donald versus Michael Atherton. The former England captain was under immense pressure and had been selected on reputation, not current form. Strangely, for a man who had captained England a record amount of times, and with a wealth of test runs behind him, Atherton still had something to prove. You know, gnarled old pro, who, who don't like anybody liking him, <laughs> Atherton. He's quite happy to be a um, unsung hero, but what a performer he is. And to think back of people who say, will he get in the team? 5,000 test runs, captain in England 50 times. Will he get in the team? It'd take a lot to keep him out. Personally, I wouldn't have picked Michael Atherton for this first test match. I would have made him fight for his place, and I think it would have been good for the morale of the cricketing fraternity in, in England to see Michael Atherton, the great Michael Atherton, fight his way back into this New England side. We were to witness some extraordinary cricket over the first two days. In perfect bowling conditions, South Africa were all over the place. Atherton and Butcher put on 179, which was a record by any country at Edgbaston for the first wicket. It was down to both exceptional batting technique and uncharacteristically wayward bowling from Donald and Pollock. The ball swung prodigiously and Sean Pollock in particular had a shocker, as did keeper Mark Boucher. I've never seen a wicket keeper made to look so poor. Even Mr. Reliable Hansi Cronier, the South African captain, couldn't set an example. But if South Africa's top bowlers have been off colour, it shouldn't detract from the performance of England's premier bats from Michael Atherton, whose hundred was full of courage and dedication. And of course, he proved me wrong straight away. The only real blemish in a superb England total of 462 was the injury to Darren Goff. We were all looking forward to the hero of the West Indies tour, Angus Fraser, bowling in tandem with a refreshed Darren Goff and a revitalised Dominic Cork. But this injury was to put Goff out for at least two test matches. I tried to wish it away kind of thing, carrying on and making out as though it, it wasn't broke, but uh, reality struck really when, when I hit the ball, first time I hit the ball after, and I, I realised then I wasn't going to be able to probably bowl during the game. Consequently, as well as Cork and Fraser bowled, England were never quite able to threaten a follow-on situation. Although, without a 104 partnership between John T. Rhodes, who made 95, and Lance Klusner, who made 57 for the eighth wicket, it could have been an issue. I thought John T. Rhodes looked in, in great nick uh, to come in on a wicket like that and just blast 90 odd the way he did. He looked in phenomenal nick. Um, and I thought they batted well all the way down. You know, Lance Klusner came in and played well at the end at number nine to have someone to come in and get 50 at number nine playing like that uh, was a great effort. Great shot. Straight down the ground. You can't get much straighter than that without clattering the ball into the stumps. But it was on the fourth day that Alex Stewart was to show his true colours. With time running out for there to be a positive result in the match, the England captain sent his batsmen out on a mission. I cannot recall such positive cricket being played in the opening match of a five-test series, and at the close of the play, England were effectively 170 for nine, a lead of 229. Sadly, there were still some ignorant members of the press who slated the England batting performance as another collapse, totally oblivious of the intentions of the England captain, Alex Stewart. The rain, of course, played the final card in washing out the final day completely, and South Africa were able to make claims that they fancied their chances of winning, and they gave all the credit to the fight back to their bowlers. In reality, Stewart had started his England reign positively. With man of the match, Michael Aston back to his best form, and the poor form of the South African bowlers, you would have expected England to have been buoyant moving on to the second test match.